This is How Rugby Made Me, brought to you by British Airways. I'm Alma Smith and I'm in Worcester today at the home of Worcester Warriors where a very good friend of our Skaz and Mo has been playing her rugby pretty much for her entire journey. She's one of those players who were there in 2014 in Paris when they lifted the trophy and she's been an absolute world-beating try-scoring machine for the Red Roses for well, a decade, pretty much. If you're one of those fans who has only started paying attention to the women's game over the last two years, then when I say Lydia Thompson, you probably think about that red card moment in the 17th minute of the final against the Black Ferns in front of a sold out Eden Park. A painful one for anyone watching on, but particularly so for England that day. When she came back from New Zealand, this is where they picked her up and put her back together again here in Worcester and the people at this club. And so the journey back from there has been a long and very painful one. But in a late curveball, just before we came up to Worcester to come speak to her here, it's also transpired that at the 11th hour, just before the start of the Premiership Women's Rugby League season, this team has lost their financial backing. And so there is so much insecurity in the air around here right now. And Lydia has still agreed to talk to me. Hello. Hi. Oh. Great to have you here. Uh, thank you. This is obviously the nice side. I've only ever been in the stands. Uh, yeah, they no, saying this is the nice side. <laughs> I, I haven't had the, the full hospital experience yet, so you need to lead the way. It'd be great to show you around. We have just stepped into a room that, I mean, they could film traitors here if mm. they needed to. Maybe we are. It's very medieval in certain really interesting ways outside of the ceiling. And it has the Worcester uh, logo in the back with some wrought iron. And it's got, there are horns around the lights. What is this, a clubhouse room? Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a boardroom with a pitch attached. <laughs> A boardroom with also some places where you can get a pint. So the clubs, when you're in the really nice seats, this is the area where they serve you snacks and drinks right behind your uh, your little box. As a player, how often do you get it get to come in here? This is probably the second time in my oh. in my career of oh. being here, so I feel very you know honoured to to have made it. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's because I've been on the pitch. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess if you, you're watching rugby, then it's a, it's a nice environment to be in. I'm just really relieved that we're not outside because it is absolutely bucketing down right now. And we're warm and ensconced in the space. The news recently hasn't been good mm -hmm. out of Worcester. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, was it shock? How did you find out that when the, the announcement came through that Worcester Warriors were not going to be mm -hmm. playing in the Premiership Women's Rugby this season? that you wouldn't be participating in the league. How did that make its way through to you guys as players? Um, yeah, I still feel like I'm processing it um, because it's been not even 48 hours. Um, and I think it's a testimony to like Joe Yap and, and Mike Hall and the staff that they literally told us as they found out. So they hadn't even processed the information. Um, and it was a huge shock. We kind of, um, despite what happened last year and kind of where we were at, it was looking really positive. Um, we had like ambition to, to play some really good rugby and we were putting that in place. I think we have got some incredible staff involved um, in the coaching team, medical team, S&C team. And so we were, yeah, in a really, really good place. Um, we were about to go out to train on a Monday night. So, um, you know, getting the layers on, done our review, prepping to, to go, and, go and do a session. And um, I think Joe had a missed call on her phone um, and she went and answered the phone, found out and came and told us. So, um, and I think that was 
that just shows the sort of openness and honesty of her. And um, so the staff were processing it at the same time we were as players. That's a lot to deal with. Definitely. What did you guys do? I think we, everyone was in a very different place. Like some of the, like the players had been through this before. Um, and so I guess there's that inkling and, and maybe it's, maybe it's, there's no point in having it, but that tiny sliver of hope of we've been here, we've come through this. Um, and then there's the other part of you that's, maybe this we've just had the season we weren't meant to have and, and maybe we've just been living on borrowed time. Um, I think, yeah, everyone was in a very different place. Um, there was definitely tears. There's lots of tears and I think that's still kind of, for me personally, I'm still processing it. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking in the spirit of rugby, we still went out and we had a touch rugby game against each other, which like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, obviously it's, uh, I'd love it if rugby could stay at Worcester, obviously, like I'm going to be optimistic, but I think at the end of the day, you've got an incredible group of people that the rugby community should be incredibly proud of, um, some amazingly talented players. So I'd, I'd advocate for every one of them to go on to another club and do incredibly well and, and be a complete asset to that club and the staff, I think. I don't think I can do justice, to be honest, to, to with my poor ability to, to create the right language to say how amazing they are and how talented and dedicated they've been. Um, they've kept going and, and not just kept going, turned up, done a job. They've gone above, above and beyond this last season, um, uh, rehabbing players through some major, major injuries, providing an SNC program programme that's, I think, making us one of the strongest, fittest teams in the league. Um, a backs and attack in shape that is exciting. And I think the, the style of rugby we, we've been playing has been really fast and we've kept the ball in play and, and we've wanted to have ambition with the style of rugby we've played. And then I think, you know, Joe Yaps led the defensive kind of style we want to play and it's got a lot of heart and a lot of passion. And um, I think, yeah, I think playing that touch rugby game, I think hopefully it's not the end of Worcester, but it's definitely not the end of hopefully these the players and the staff's careers uh, in rugby. I love that spirit. Mm -hmm. you, this isn't just a club that you've played for for the last year or two. It's not even the club that you've just played for as a premiership player. This is where you basically started out your rugby journey. You're a one club girl. Mm -hmm. So this place is so much more than just the team that you're playing for at the moment. Because you started playing your rugby here at the amateur club and now you're playing at, mm -hmm. at the level that you are, this place probably means a little more to you than it does to the average person. Yeah, I think, yeah, I've got so many fond memories and I, I owe the club so much. I don't, I definitely didn't play for England and I haven't done the things I've done off my own back. Like I've, been, it's been a testimony of the volunteers, the coaches, the support, the, the friends I've got, the teammates I've had and still have, who have pushed me and believed in me and kept me going and given me opportunities. And, you know, I wouldn't have done half of what I've achieved if it wasn't for that. So, yeah, it means it's got, yeah, it, I guess I don't really, I just see myself as within it. It's really hard to put into words, actually, and I think I'm still processing that. Mm. And you're still processing that because of how significant that woven togetherness of your journey as a rugby player and this place and this club, mm -hmm. the two are so intertwined mm. that now trying to think of them as two separate entities must be nearly impossible to even imagine. Let's talk about Worcester Wanderers. Worcester Wanderers, it's basically on site. It's just mm -hmm. across the road here. And it's different to this very traitors like mm -hmm. fancy room that we're sitting in because it's, it's just a lot less grand. Mm -hmm. it's, 
talk me through that place. Yeah. When did you first join? What was it like? What is it like today? And are there tons of little Lydia's around now? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I got introduced to rugby at school, loved it. I love sport in general, but there was just something really special about rugby, like getting to run around, beat the boys, you know, things like yeah, that yeah. Uh, as an 11 year old meant a lot. Um, so I went to Starbridge, which was is is an amazing family club. Um, yeah. At one point, me, I've got two sisters and my brother were playing there um, for different age groups. And that was brilliant. But um, when I got more into West Midlands and playing for my region, I got introduced a lot to the the Wanderers, the Worcester setup, and it was so exciting because I had this girls pathway. Like I didn't realize girls could play rugby until I played at school, and I didn't realize women could play rugby. I know that sounds really um, and naive, but I thought it was just a fun game to play while you were young, and then to see this pathway where there was the under 15s, you know under 16s, under 18s, and then this women's section was just like, wow, um, opened up a whole door to me. So I, I turned up, um, I think, I think I just moved out of ankle boots and I'm really embarrassed to say that, but my dad was definitely a huge um, influencer of me. And um, he said I needed ankle boots because I actually did, I was a number eight flanker at the time. So, um, and, I had the shirt that was so long and so wet and so like, I, I just looked a real treat. Um, <laughs> turned up here and just, I just loved the the coaches. They were brilliant at like, the volunteers and the coaches definitely made that club mm -hmm. what it was. They gave us girls such an opportunity to, to develop and grow within a really safe environment. And so I've got so many happy memories of playing for the Wanderers. Yeah, I owe that a lot. Like. They're just an awesome, it's just an awesome rugby community there. Mm. It's a great clubhouse. It didn't used to be like um, as posh as it is. It was just changing rooms, but now it's got like a really nice clubhouse section. And I think it's just, you know, when you've walked in a clubhouse, there's a smell yeah. to like a rugby clubhouse. Yeah. And that that's kind of, yeah, it takes me straight back there as soon as I go over to that, that side of, the, of Worcester. I love that for you. I love that you have that place because so many girls who excel athletically, we lose them by the wayside mm. somewhere in their teens at some point. Definitely. They don't have the wrong, right coach or they don't have the right support or they don't have the right teammates, mm. but something goes wrong. And we're, we're all still trying to figure out how to keep more girls playing throughout to keep building that momentum and to develop your skill. Mm. So the fact that you had a place like this and that it led you on the path that you've been on is just so beautiful. I feel so lucky. And I think that like, in answer to your question about is there still little Lydia's, but definitely not. I, I think they've probably got a lot more fashion sense and, and boot quality, <laughs> but- um, No ankle boots. Yeah, exactly. But um, <laughs> I think there's some real talent and I think Worcester, like the last couple of seasons, well, in my whole time playing Worcester, we've definitely felt that talent coming through. Like the skill level, level of the players at the moment is just phenomenal. And, you know, we're putting that out on the pitch. The quality of the game, I think, is just going higher and higher and higher because there's so many girls staying in the game and playing at such a high standard so early on. And um, yeah, it's really exciting to, to see where that's going to take us. Talk to me about staying here throughout and being an, a one club girl. You've spoken before about the fact that you just couldn't imagine yourself playing somewhere else. But it's not like you have been on like a 10 year unbeaten run back here. I mean, it's not like that's been the thing. So what has been the thing that has kept you here? I do like winning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think we do, we have like that mentality within us. Like we want to win games. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when I started playing for Worcester, we, the first couple of seasons, we won the Premiership 2013, yeah. Yeah. Um, showing my age. But, um, and I was around, like, it was very odd going, you know, rocking up at training and training alongside just sort of Danielle Watermans, Cat Merchants, Michelle Clarks, um, just some amazing people. So, yeah, I think, like, that definitely made Worcester the sort of, the standard we wanted to play at. Mm. I think we've kind of 
had a had lows as well. We've um, n- like had a few seasons where we've not been in the position we'd like to have been on mm. the table. But I think what what keeps me staying here is definitely the people. I think you can't, and I think every club's got that. You know, some of my best friends play for other clubs. I, I, I wouldn't say it's just Worcester that has it. I think mm. rugby does get that right. But um, I've just got such a connection to the people here. And, um, you know, I just feel completely inspired by them. Like to be able to be coached and to know Jo Yap, I feel like it's a huge honour. And I've learned so much from her um, as a person and owe her, owe her so much. So um, I definitely think it's the people that makes this club special. Talk to me about deciding to go ahead with this interview. Because mm-hmm. you haven't granted many interviews since New Zealand. Mm-hmm. You spoke to ITV and you spoke to Scrum Queens. Mm-hmm. And in both those interviews, you said, this isn't woe is me. Mm-hmm. This isn't poor mm-hmm. me. I've gone through this. This is a moment of gratitude. This is me mm-hmm. saying, these are the people that have helped me. Mm-hmm. Why now, considering how difficult it's been recently? Again, I was going to say no to this. Um, as lovely as you are. And um, I'm, not, I'm not a very confident person I find it quite hard um, to talk but it's not about me this interview I know like we're looking at my journey and and through my lens and and through my experience but this is I hope shining a light in potentially quite a dark time for Worcester shining a bit of light on what a special place this is and the people that have made this place so special and I hope that you know, there's that little glimmer of me that really, really hopes in when this comes out that we've had a miracle and, um, yeah, that this isn't the end. But if it is, it's, I really hope that the rugby community opens up their arms to the players and staff that deserve to be recognised and to have opportunities. It's been a really tough 12 months. Mm-hmm. You guys have just, as you say, you've been through so much and you can't help but wonder if this was all just borrowed time. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the huge amount of fight and what the residual effect of that is, because I can just imagine the cohesion between you guys as a group must Mm. be off the charts Mm. because of everything you've been through in in the last 12 months now. You never want to go for adversity, but it's definitely pulled us so tightly um, as a group. Uh, I think, you know, last last time round, players were cooking for after-match meals. Um, We were training back on the the Wanderers pitches just to have a floodlight and to have a a pitch. You know, Joe Yap was doing that without any any security, any future um, security from a wage or anything like that just because she loves the game and and believes in the players so I think yeah it's been a tough 12 months but then I don't think at any point we felt sorry for ourselves it's been we deserve to be in the premiership we've got an incredibly talented group of players and you know to be honest our ambition was to be a top four team this year so I don't think we came out of last year thinking We've just about survived. It was about proving kind of we're a, we're a top four team, and and I think that just says a lot about the staff and the players and the place we were in before this happened. Yeah, you were you were you were on a mission to be competitive. Definitely. How has Joe managed until now to keep all of you guys here? Because I would like her to write a book mm, on the how to. <laughs> do this because you have no reason to be able to retain your players group and i just looked at you guys constantly and went none of them are leaving (laughs) yeah i i totally agree she should write a book um i would definitely read it (laughs) Um, i mean that like everyone's gonna have their own version of joe yap um and but i think she's just such She's such an incredible human. Um, she makes time for people. Um, I think oh, it's hard. <laughs> and, you know, I think everyone everyone will, 
people speak so well of Jo, whether they've been coached by her back in Exeter Uni or, you know, back in under 20s. I, everyone's got something good to say about her as a person. And I think the loyalty players show is because she shows that back and you know that she's not afraid to have the tough conversations um, if that's what is need to ha needs to happen. But she would do that with humility and, and honesty. The fact that you feel so grateful for having someone who's mm. played such a key role makes me really happy for the fact that you had someone here. A hundred percent. I don't think it would have carried on with with many other people other than Jo Yap and the, and the team, the staff team that she's pulled around her. Um, yeah, I owe her a lot and yeah, I think it kind of takes you back to kind of why do you stay and you know, none of us are on huge salaries or you know, we don't <laughs> have the best kit at times, you know, but we were good. But there's something so special about playing under someone you would do anything for and you know she'd do anything for you and I think that's definitely so valuable and something you can't take for granted. And the personal growth that you experience in periods like this of adversity but the gains that you have from being led by someone who leads in this way mm -hmm. I mean, that stuff will stay with you forever. Like those lessons and the modeled behavior that mm -hmm. all of you guys have now had the experience of is going to impact so many other people's lives. And so it just keeps lighting the flame further and further and further, which is beautiful. And I love that you are here for it because you could have just come back from New Zealand and said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out, like I've done my part. Rugby's been hard enough. Thank you. Bye. Yes. <laughs> and Joe was once again the person there who picked you up and said, come, come. Yeah. How? <laughs> because that's like, there's, there's something about keeping the team together in a, t in a period where there's so much insecurity um, and you want to inspire and develop people. But there's a completely different conversation when it's an individual like you who've been through what you went through in New Zealand. How did she manage to be there with you in such a painful time and get through? Because you say yourself that you were so numb mm -hmm. and that it was just a survival mechanism mm -hmm. almost where you just step back. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's gone through a traumatic experience, regardless of the scale of it, can relate to that. So I'm really fascinated by how she got through to you, or was it just the fact that she was there the whole time? It's this consistent presence, even if there's not much movement on the surface of it in that time. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's definitely um, never playing rugby again. Um, so that's where you were. You came yeah, back from New Zealand yeah. and you said, I'm yeah. never playing again. Thanks. Bye. Definitely. Um, I think you hurt where you care and you care where you hurt. And I was definitely hurting. I didn't think she'd want to kind of speak to me, like, to be honest, I felt I'd let so many people down. Uh, so she sent me a message about meeting up for a coffee. <laughs> so, um, oh, I didn't really want to, cause I felt so ashamed but she was just so understanding and kind. Um, I think it, she, which I think has really shocked me about the whole experience because I felt so um, like, I, yeah, I didn't deserve forgiveness or kindness or love. And she showed me all that. Um, and she was really open as well with, you know, when you step into that arena or on that rugby pitch, you're trying to be as brave and vulnerable as you can be. And it doesn't always go right. And, and that's the game, I guess. And she shared that with me. And I think it was like, we've all had our highs and, we, and it's great when it goes well, but we've had our lows and kind of that's our common vulnerability as being humans and, and being rugby players that like, for me, I never, ever 
want to hurt a player. And I think the, the whole incident hurting someone was just like, ah, oh, never why I wanted to play rugby and probably one of the hardest things that I've found kind of um, through the whole experience. To have that and then to let so many people down, um, I felt so ashamed. Uh, so yeah, I think she spoke to me and she kind of just um, eased me back in. Like, I think she would phone me up after sessions to check out I was okay, because I really was struggling. Um, I was hardly training or eating or sleeping. So she kind of never put pressure for me to perform. It was more for me to just keep moving and keep and to not, not let one moment kind of change my whole feeling towards rugby because I was so ready to just close the door and and um, yeah I hope that no one would ever recognize me when I left the house and as awesome as it is that the game of women's rugby is so recognizable now it's great um, you know my neighbors watch the game so everywhere I went I felt like I had to kind of numb down and yeah it, it, that was really tough but she kind of didn't want me to leave rugby in that place. And I think that was really powerful that she believed in me um, in that way. So yeah, just to get through that 20 minutes against DMP, that was my first game back. It was 20 minutes of rugby. Um, just to back me to, to have a starting shirt and just get on that pitch and get that 20 minutes over and done with was amazing. And I, I'm really grateful she did that because I think I would have easily not have put myself in that place. I was so nervous. Um, I've never been so nervous for a game of rugby before. I think I'd completely lost trust in myself of like not making it. I think because I just trusted my instinct. I trusted whether I'd ever make a safe tackle again. Just so many things uh, I'd kind of really struggled with and she just backed me and I think that says so much about her. It's really interesting to me when I watched that final we still spoke afterwards and I said I really hope Lydia has the support she needs because I felt the thing that would have been the hardest for me to cope with in that situation if I were in your shoes would be publicly making a mistake mm -hmm. because it's very public mm -hmm. but all you talk about is the injuring someone else and you are an OT by trade you're an mm -hmm. occupational therapist so this makes so much more sense to me now because your whole career outside of rugby is guiding people through healing so the thought that you were the person doing the harm in that moment, mm -hmm. even inadvertently, it's not what you went in to do, but mm -hmm. the inadvertent side effect is that Porsche left the field. Mm -hmm. That's the part that really scarred you. Yeah, I feel like I really struggle to, to forgive myself for that. I don't, I don't think I ever will. Um, and I think then, yeah, letting down your team I think you play rugby because you want to be part of something bigger than yourself and you want to you want to do everything you possibly can to know you came off that pitch and gave everything you emptied the tank you made your tackles you put your body on the line you know we talk about that and that's what I've lived by and I felt like I'd just let them all down um, so yeah I think it two things that I've I would say like key parts of what I find important, I'd, I'd failed on, mm -hmm. definitely. I have so much respect for the fact that you kept moving and you came back <laughs> because that is the bravest thing you can do, is to step back out there. And you played in what at the moment seems to have been Worcester's last game as mm -hmm. well. How has that helped you heal? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be the last game, to be honest. And I played at Flanker, so um, that was a shock to all of us. 
um, mainly me, um, <laughs> to try and learn line outs in a week, I think is, yeah. I've got a lot of respect for forwards. I've just grown a load more. I felt like I was on an internship into the world of being a forward. But um, I guess ugh, I, I, I'm still processing that. Um, I, I wasn't meant to play. I was kind of thinking maybe I need to retire. For some reason, I've got this fear in my head that I'm too old. Um, I'm 31. And I guess I'm starting to question, can I keep up anymore? Um, Have you heard of Johnny Sexton? <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I mean. I, I feel like I don't know who's told myself that I'm too old. Um, especially when some of the most incredible athletes at the moment are in their 30s. And I do think, why am I questioning that? Um, so, yeah, I, I was kind of thinking, toying with retiring, and I'd spoken to Joe about stepping back this season, kind of be a break glass in case of emergency sort of player. Um, and we picked up a few niggles that week, so she was breaking the glass. Um, and I think that was me protecting myself, that I didn't want to care anymore about rugby. I wanted to kind of move on and, and yeah, enjoy doing a 5K park run kind of, you know, vibe, um, not 80 minutes of body on the line rugby, but... Um, Playing flanker literally yeah. is the opposite of the 5K yeah. park run. I was really hoping that would be my new life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I really enjoyed it. I had so much fun. I think you, you'll you never lose that love of doing something with a team. Um, I think it's a huge honor when you get to pull on a rugby shirt. Like you said, you never know when it will be your last. Um, and I'm really glad I did. You are the girl who's tried, that time you burned Portia Woodman is in every highlights reel. I mean, that person is still in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about Worcester and isn't that crazy that the thing that we tend to talk to you about is this one moment when there's 10 years of you being an absolute, like, world-beating try scorer before then? Do you sometimes feel like because of the flood of attention and interest in the women's game being so recent that a lot of the stuff that you did in the years prior to that have kind of slipped by unnoticed? I guess that's a, the thing with women's rugby in, in a way like you know the growth has been so rapid yeah. um and I mean the legends that have come before me their footage is out there but like the quality of the camera work and stuff just isn't the same is it but the power the speed the 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 movement of the ball was exactly the same in in many ways and you know uh having watched some of the g games of our red rose legends you know they're absolute machines, aren't they? These these heroes of the game that should be honoured and, and should be um, visible and should be seen. But um, yeah, I guess it, rugby for me when I first came up was like, mom, dad, I've got this YouTube channel if you want to watch. And, um, and uh, you know, it'd be at whatever time in the morning and, and, and there'd be like, couple of views or if we played in England it would be like you, you would know everyone in the crowd yeah. you know I would know the families that were supporting us and if there's a few other spectators that was great so it's gone from that uh, all the way to selling out big stadiums Eden Park incredible yeah Eden Park full of people yeah I uh, wish it was empty but I'm joking <laughs> yeah. but no I think it's phenomenal yeah. I think it was yeah. phenomenal and I think that's incredibly exciting, um, and rightly so. Like the the legends that have become before us deserve that recognition, mm -hmm. and would have, we're producing incredible rugby that deserve that sort of audience. But because of them paving the way and, and for keep pushing, we, we now get it, and I think it's very exciting where this is going to go next. You have played ten years of international mm -hmm. rugby. You realise you're one of those people, right? <laughs> Something I'm old. Oh, gosh. But yeah, no, I, de I definitely don't. <laughs> because you've made such a very real contribution to so many really big Red Roses moments over the last decade. You are one of those <laughs> great people that young players now can, they stand on your shoulders. 
yeah, I guess like you don't see that at the time potentially because you're just, you're around, you know, people who are very competitive. Like I've always been pushed by better wingers and, you know, I've always felt very honored to get the 14 shirt because before that, that was Cat Merchant's shirt. Like um, I was lucky to come off the bench for her. So it was kind of, you don't realize kind of maybe i maybe i look back one day and go oh that was pretty cool but the in the moment all you're doing is kind of pushing pushing yourself trying to deserve the next start in shirt if 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 you can and i've always been the one that's looking back at my game and thinking how can i improve where did i go wrong how can i make myself better and that's kind of been my mentality for the the whole time like 10 years have you got a favorite try <laughs> is there one um, is there one you can actually watch and go, oh, that was actually pretty good? <laughs> That's the thing. I can tell you all the, the ones that should have been better. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of my tries are, are off the back of some great, great play before that. And I've just got the, the honour of dying the ball over the line. Um, you know, I'm very lucky to have played outside Emily Scarra. I do know that. You know, I've had an incredibly dominant forward pack in front of me who have secured top quality ball you know the service of ball I've been able to receive over the years has kind of allowed me to to score the tries I do believe that but I think one try that I always think back to is one of my first tries it was in my first cap tournament in the Euros um, and we were in the final minute of the game we were losing to France Danielle Waterman she didn't dummy me and she passed me the ball and <laughs> again, she's, she's a great player. I'm glad she's done with me on many occasions because she's gone on and scored very good tries. But she passed me the ball and I just ran. Like, I just remember just got to get to this try line. Um, being chased down by French players who are incredible players. And we've always had like such close games. And I've got it over the try line, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old. And... Um, scored and we won and uh, yeah the final whistle went and it was just phenomenal to kind of go from yeah I've got my first cap for England and you think how hard it is to get that first cap for England it's you never think it's going to happen until it's happened I think that try made me like really think I'm I really love being here I love being part of this team um I want to score more tries for England <laughs> Yeah, now I need to keep, yeah. now I need to stay <laughs> on top of the mountain. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. When you first picked up a ball, in your mind's eye, what was the pinnacle? What was the ceiling? And how far over that did you go in real terms? Like when you started playing rugby, what was your goal and your dream? Like I said, I didn't think girls or women played rugby. So like my teach primary school teacher at the time Sam Hood she was like oh I think you'd like tag rugby I was kind of like like one of the good kids but also like love sport like love sport so she kind of said do you want to come and play some tag rugby and yeah I just thought it was the best um it reminded me recently actually I was doing some coaching with some girls and they came that none of them had played rugby before and they came to the session and they looked perfect they had like their hair plaited like perfect socks just looked so like yeah calm and serene and and lovely and then we got the tackle shields out and they were initially like a little bit put yeah the little push like, okay and then we're like no girls like come on drop your shoulder let's go oh my goodness it was awesome like <laughs> They left the session, hair everywhere, socks down, covered in mud. And it just, it was so nice to see that joy of like being a muddy girl. And I think that's really reminded me of how much I love that joy of not having to be perfect for a second and, and for just, to just be muddy, dirty, cold, little blood, you know, a little bit of blood, a little bit of different to how I tried to be. Um, you know, I always tried to get the good score on my exams and you know I wanted everyone to like me and I wanted to like do well so to have a couple of times a week where I could just let go of that was just so powerful and um yeah so <laughs> I think going from that little girl to 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 getting into England just I didn't even know that was a possibility I didn't even know that's what you could do um but yeah I watched 2010 and 
they lost and in the final the red roses to new zealand and i just saw athletes i just saw some you know you maggie alfonsi's you sort of rachel burford's oh, gosh i could name the team but they were just these heroes to me because i was just a little scrawny kid that liked having muddy knees and you know just loved running around so to see that you could take this and, and make something of yourself was, was just so inspiring and I was really lucky to have so many inspiring people who who um, who coached me who mentored me who supported in me who gave me opportunities and I remember the lead in 2014 I didn't think they'd take me because I was young was very raw kind of um, the technical tactical side of the game didn't really have much of a clue apart from catch the ball and run and I'm not sure if I've built much more on that <laughs> but um, I, that was very much what I offered the team a very raw part of my game and I really didn't believe I'd ever get there and I remember doing one session and we were catching high balls and I think I dropped every single one of them I was oh. terrible I was just couldn't catch these high balls and I just wanted to leave I was just like can't do this I, I'm I'm rubbish. Um, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> and um, and I think I got into journaling, actually, one my physiotherapist, Lou Davis, who's been a huge part of my career, said, just write, just start journaling. Just if you, you might not go, but if you start to believe you can, um, and what would you do? And it was kind of like, I'm going to go out there and drop more balls, but in the pursuit of trying to catch one. Mm -hmm. And then once I started believing that, you know, I'm just gonna catch one ball a session. Every time that high ball goes up, instead of trying to run the opposite way to it and hope someone else will catch it, <laughs> I'm gonna put my name on it and I'm gonna have a go at catching it. And I think that was one of the best like learnings I ever had of just, you might drop it, but, but why not have a go? Why not? <laughs> I love that. And that trope of the good girl is so relatable because so many girls turn six, turn seven, go to school and start behaving in the way the teachers want them to and start mm -hmm. earning the scores that their parents want to see. And they start ticking off all of the little boxes, that little to-do list of being mm -hmm. the good girl. And they start getting that fix. Mm -hmm. So you just stay mm -hmm. there in the safe lines and sport gives you the opportunity to go out there and really push it a little bit and a contact sport even more so mm -hmm. but it also gives you the opportunity to fail mm -hmm. in a structured way and test what that feels like and build that resilience because in every other respect of your development being the good girl is such a standard that you have to mm -hmm. constantly adhere to and excel against whereas i feel like we give boys so much space to fail mm -hmm. and we give boys so much room to test themselves. And I've never thought about rugby in that context, but it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's such a rush watching women out there, like just really risking it, mm -hmm. their physical safety, but also risking failing. Mm -hmm. I think it's like you said, within the context of a sport, an environment where, you know, we never want to see anyone fail. Like, we, you never want to see kids fail, I guess, when you're a parent or. Rigby's definitely given me that opportunity to grow and to fail a lot and to keep getting back up and, and have good mentors and people around me that have, have believed in me even when I haven't. And I think that's such an important part of what rugby does give people. And you are a bit like Mo was, the collateral damage in this profile that the sport has gained. You are now a household name for so many more people and so when you do fail and things don't go the way you want them to, you carry that load in the most painful periods of coming back from it. Mm -hmm. But you do realize, right, that 
the experience you had in 2010 watching on and then coming through the ranks, how much bigger the number of girls will be mm -hmm. saying, I watched Lydia mm -hmm. Thompson and I wanted to be like her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You look so uncomfortable <laughs> with that. I think I do. I think, I think it's more the... I think that is a huge honor. And, you know, if I've played a tiny, tiny part in someone believing in themselves, then, you know, I feel very grateful. Um, I feel extremely grateful. And I think that's been a huge driver of why I've carried on a lot of the time, um, is trying to make sure that the little muddy girls out there know that there's a place for them. And that, you know, whether that's whether they get to pull on their international shirt or just their just just a rugby shirt that there's a place for them. And I think that's what has kept me going a lot of this time. Um, not because I feel like a role model, but just because I feel like I want to I want to stand up for those girls and say, you know, don't give up. Um, so, yeah. Can you reflect on the tournament as a whole yet? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because I think it's really hard not to kind of see it all with that that final game but um, yeah I, I think I'm still struggling to kind of not see it just through the eyes of the final game but I think you know going into that tournament the Red Roses was well it still is in a really strong place um, there's a huge amount of talent in that room and trying to get into that room and you know just to make a, a Red Roses um, team is tough. So to make a, a World Cup team for the third time was a huge honour. And I think I have to look back at that and go that I did do that. Um, That's significant. <laughs> definitely. And I think, I think I still really struggle to not let the final kind of cloud that. But yeah. It is, it is an honour to pull on an England shirt, so I do need to remember that. Where's the silver medal now? <laughs> I don't know. I know that that probably sounds terrible. And part of me wants to put it up on the wall to, to remind myself, but I don't know if I can yet, <laughs> and I don't know where it is. Um, yeah. I look forward to the day <laughs> you put it up. Thank you. Because I, I believe that you'll get there. Mm. It's obviously a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and I really appreciate that you're talking about it. Thank because you. this is you taking people with you in this journey. Mm -hmm. And it's such a generous step to take. Because I can see how much it still hurts. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah. I definitely don't want to not recognize how incredible it is. And I think, you know, we're extremely lucky to have a medal. Extremely lucky to make a final. And I don't want to discredit that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it just still hurts. What is the journey looking like now? Like, there's so much insecurity. No one quite knows what, what awaits around the corner for Worcester Warriors. But Lydia Thompson, mm -hmm. are we, have you got the Six Nations on your radar? Have you got 25 on your radar? Are you going to be playing in 29 like Johnny Sexton? Like, what, what are your personal goals and ambitions at the moment? And are you thinking that far ahead? I need to know what Johnny's secret is, but um, no, I've, I've lost so I lost so much confidence in myself, and uh, yeah, and um, I think just getting out on the weekend was like was almost like letting the guard down um, and having a go again, and now this has happened I don't know there's part of me that's like will I be happy park running on a Saturday or do I want to be still putting my boots on yeah I feel like <laughs> I feel like you're more the latter <laughs> yeah. mm. I could park run and put a little assault course in there as well but yeah I think there's that part of me that I do love rugby but again I try and protect myself and mm. pretend I don't <laughs> Well, we look forward to seeing you again. Oh, thank you. Wherever it will be, in whatever shirt you will be wearing, because your contributions to the game have been immense.
and you're an occupational therapist. So all of these things are, it's not tax deductible, but it's emotionally tax deductible. <laughs> I think that you said earlier, like, there's a real humble side to me now going through this. It's a real side that of me that's matured and kind of, yeah, sees that we never want to make mistakes, but that is part of being human at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I can help one person and make time for one person, I think, okay, this, this would all make sense. Um, yeah, I think feeling so low um, and not really thinking there was a future to now sitting in this weird room and talking to you <laughs> and about rugby. I just hope there's people out there who are wherever they are in whatever place they're in just keeps going and mm. knows that it feels very odd when you think this will pass because at that time you think that's it's never going to change it's never there's no future but I really hope that they can there's someone there for them that and they can dig in and go you know just one more day you are so impressive do you know that <laughs> Thank you. It's been so good to speak to you. And we're so excited about the role you will still play in whatever way. Thank you. Brought to you by British Airways, bringing original people, places and cultures together for more than 100 years.